Welcome back to Honors Calculus. In the last couple of videos, we've seen the fundamental theorem of calculus. If f of x is the indefinite integral of little f of x dx, running out of space there, then big F prime of x is equal to little f of x plus some arbitrary constant of integration. And we saw how incredibly powerful this is when it comes to indefinite integrals. If you can figure out what function you need to take the derivative of to get your integrand, the argument of the integral, then you can work backwards and say that original function is the result of the integral. In this video, we're going to extend that to get what I'm going to call the second fundamental theorem of calculus, but a lot of textbooks call the main fundamental theorem of calculus, where we can now use this idea to evaluate definite integrals without having to write out summations anymore. So let me get my head out of the way. There we go. And let's just state the second fundamental theorem of calculus. If we have an antiderivative, big F prime of X is equal to little f of X, then the integral from A to B of little f of X dX is equal to big F of B minus big F of A. And the proof here is straightforward enough that we could almost call this a corollary to the fundamental theorem of calculus. In most textbooks that call this the first fundamental theorem of calculus, the proof is incredibly lengthy, but because we don't, or because we already have something else called the first fundamental theorem of calculus, it's done the heavy lifting for us. By the first fundamental theorem of calculus, big F of X is the indefinite integral of little f of X dX, maybe plus some arbitrary constant, right? All I know is that big F prime is equal to little f. I may or may not have the constant right, so to be careful about that, let's sneak that arbitrary constant in. Big f of x plus c. Now remember that the indefinite integral by definition is the integral from some point a to some point x of f of u du. Sorry, I'm abusing notation. I actually can't call this a because it's going to get confused with the other a that we have. Uh, so let's call it um, let's call it a Greek alpha, Greek letter A, just so it's not confused with the A that's in the statement of the second fundamental theorem. Now from that, I can evaluate that f of a plus c is equal to the integral from alpha to a of f of u du and big f of b 
plus C is equal to the integral from alpha to B of F of U DU. Now here's where I start to get a little bit cute. The integral from A to B of F of X DX, I can split up as the integral from A to alpha of f of x dx plus the integral from alpha to b of f of x dx. And using the other property of limits of integration, I can take the negative of that first integrand and switch the order. So it's the integral from alpha to a of f of x dx and the integral from alpha to b of f of x dx. And when you are performing a limit, the only point of the variable here is to tell you which thing is your, uh, which thing are you integrating and which thing is constant. So we could just as easily call that u instead of a. That's what we mean by calling it a dummy variable. It doesn't matter what letter you use because when you take the integral, you're going to kind of consume that variable anyway. But by explicitly stating it like this, we can see that this first integrand is going to be f of a plus our constant of integration. And the second integrand is going to be big F of b plus our constant of integration. And then it's just uh, some simple algebra to see that we have a minus C and a plus C that cancel each other out. And if I rearrange terms, so it's written as subtraction instead of addition, this is F of B minus F of A. There we go. So to evaluate a definite integral, you no longer need to figure out how to write out the summations. You no longer need to use the limit. You can dive right in So if I want to evaluate the integral from one to five of two x squared plus three x plus seven, I need to stop and think about how to take derivatives. All right, this is a polynomial. And I remember that when I take derivatives, it always decreases the uh, power by one. So to take a derivative of something and end up with a second degree polynomial, the thing I started with has to be a third degree polynomial. Let's just go ahead and dive in with x cubed plus x squared plus x plus one. The derivative there would be three x squared plus two x plus one. And then we start playing our matching game. Right. For our first coefficient, we have three, we want two. We have our second coefficient, two, we want three. And our constant, we have one, we want seven. So how do we play around with that? Well, that three is going to be based on the coefficient here. The two is going to be based on the coefficient here. And the one's going to be based on the coefficient there. So what do we need? Well, taking the derivative of x cubed is going to multiply the coefficient by three. What do we multiply by three to get two? Two thirds. All right. What do we multiply by two to get three? Three halves. 
What do we multiply by one to get seven? Oh, seven. And that last term can be any constant we'd like. But when we take the derivative here, we do in fact get two x cubed plus three. If I put the squared there that I said I was putting there, three x plus seven. I am really bad at writing exponents in this video. I apologize. Right. So our antiderivative is two thirds x cubed plus three halves x squared plus seven x plus anything we want. Well, we're going to be trying to evaluate this function at a couple of points. So using the simplest anything we want is going to be the best trick. How about zero? Pick C equals zero. We can choose any value of C we'd like. Picking zero makes this as easy as possible. So with that, the integral from one to five of two x squared plus three x plus seven with respect to x is going to be the function two thirds x cubed plus three halves x squared plus seven x evaluated at one and evaluated at five. Um, this notation here, put the function in brackets, put the limits of integration there helps as a nice way of notating out what we are trying to do. Um, sometimes instead of putting brackets, you'll just see a vertical line put to the right of the expression. It's just a notational convenience to make it a little bit easier to write the process out, especially if you want to skip those two steps in the middle where I tested some differentiations. But either way, this is telling us to evaluate the expression when x is five. So we'll have two thirds times five cubed plus three halves times five squared plus seven times five. And then evaluate the same thing when x is one and subtract them. So we have two thirds times one cubed, three halves times one squared and seven times one. All right, uh, five cubed is 125 times two is 250. Five squared is 25 times three is 75. And then we have minus two thirds, we have minus three halves, remember to distribute that subtraction and minus seven. Very often, when you, very often when you integrate, you are going to have fractions all over the place. Often you'll have radicals as well. My suggestion is to try to clean up each on their own and then worry about trying to combine. So in this case, we have a couple of fractions that have a denominator of three, a couple of fractions that have a denominator of two. We don't always get things to work nicely, but sometimes we do. Right. 248 over three. 72 over two and 28. Uh, 248 over three, unfortunately does not reduce. But 72 over two is 36. And 36 plus 28 is 64. Which is the same thing as 192 over three. And if I want to add 248 plus 192, I'm going to get 380. I'm sorry, 480. No, why can't I arithmetic? Uh, add the two, that's 250 plus 190, 
350 plus 90, 440. Four hundred forty over three, as the result of this integration. All right, here's one for you to try. At the same time, a little bit easier and a little bit harder. Let's take the integral from negative pi to pi. of secant x times tangent x dx. Play around with that one, see where you can get, and I'll see you in the next video.